really, really blessed to have uh, Boston Blockchain Week here, and uh, thank you, Cubic, for hosting. We are standing in uh, the birthplace of freedom. Um, and so today, I want to talk about that, and also the future internet, the app layer, blockchain advancements, the path to a new and inclusive internet era. So let's get it started. Anyone know who this is? Oh, we're right there. Yeah. Anyone know who that is? Yeah, $100 bill guy, awesome. Yeah, so um, that's Ben Franklin. I, I like Ben Franklin. I also like him with uh, sunglasses. And he said famously, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest, right? So today we're gonna learn about the internet and money. Also from right here, not too long ago, before the American Revolution, these are banknotes. Uh, right there, a big one is New York. Then there's Rhode Island right next to it. Then there is uh, Pennsylvania. So couple hundred miles in between, but if I wanted to go from Rhode Island to uh, here where we're standing in Quincy, uh, it wouldn't have worked. I wouldn't have been able to transact. And this problem is micro at this point in time, but it's macro now. And believe it or not, this is also how blockchains are working right now. So um, now we have the US dollar. Again, US dollar guy. That's why we put Ben Franklin in here. But if I wanted to go to France right now, who helped us uh, get our independence, I wouldn't be able to transact. I'd have to, again, change money. So what's something that doesn't work like that? That would happen to be the internet. This is a map of the internet right now in 2024 and the percentage of the population that has access to it. Big blue part, like the dark blue, is the most amount of internet access, all the way down to the least in terms of uh, like zero to 9% in the darkest color there. Um, and so when we look at this, we realize that the internet is free, it's cheap, it's fast, it's borderless, right? And what has it done to the planet? Well, this is another map overlaid on this, and this is the countries or territories by uh, GDP. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, obviously, considering that GDP can be you know, uh, an indicator either way. Um, but as you can see, the, the blue part right there, well, that's also where people have the most money, the most financial freedom. And so my big question for most of my career, um, which has been in blockchain, is why doesn't money work more like the internet? Um, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, just five seconds about me. Uh, Boston native, crypto nerd, uh, spent my time in a couple of large exchanges, including Binance, where I ran around 2% of the global hash rate. I was in mining at the time. Then got interested in DeFi, went over to Rain. Uh, service the Middle East. Uh, I was head of innovation there, and then finally uh, started Trustware recently. Uh, we're a peer-to-peer -peer, um, payments network for uh, people to be able to send any asset anywhere to anyone. So kind of the idea here. Let's hop into the internet, because before, just like we wanted to look at kind of where we've come from, where we're going, we need to understand what the internet did. So some of you, not me, but some of you might be old enough to remember DNS and the time before that, right? IP addresses to dot coms, okay? So this is essentially when 10, it, the internet hosts grow by 10x. Now we just use IP addresses for our routers. Next is SSL, secure socket. This is the security type. And you can see effectively that these kind of protocols and infrastructure advancements move us forward in this, right? So this is when Amazon, eBay, et cetera, come through. Um, this is the financialization of the internet, and, and we grow by 14x, right? It's basically from 20 million all the way up to 280 million, giant improvement. And then single sign-on, this is the access point, right? This is where I could take my Gmail account and I can log into anything. So one account, any app, really, really crucial. Now let's hop into what we're all actually interested in. This is Web3, so, sim, follows a very similar pathway, right? This is Bitcoin, 2009. Title of the white paper, I try to read it every year. I love that, um, I love that paper, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Now everyone in the world has access to money, right? Permissionless, borderless, holy crap. Um, that's the protocol level. Then we go to the multi-sig side of things. This is security. This is no more one single private key, right? You wouldn't trust your new codes with one key, one crazy president. That's why they have them in two separate rooms, two different codes, have to push at the same time. Very similar thing to here. This makes wallets more secure. Now we can actually use it. This is infrastructure. Then programmable money, 2015, that's Ethereum, right? Smart contracts, the ability to actually build more interesting things on chain. And this is the advancements from protocols to infrastructure. Now let's look at kind of where we are right now. ENS, and you can start to see the patterns, right? ENS, human readable names. MPC, this is cost efficient security, off chain signatures for DeFi, et cetera. Account abstraction, I don't have to actually sign it. I can have some, like I can have kind of 
signatures um, that are, are not me literally clicking sign. Um, so starting to automate more things. And there's a ton of other stuff that we could go into, but for time, um, I've put together some stuff elsewhere here so you can ask me for it later. Really easy way to understand this just so that we're all framed and then we could get into the meaty stuff. Blockchain architecture. This is how I look at it. I'm not sure how many people other, uh, how many else do, but this is the protocol layer, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum. Then the walls of the structure, infrastructure layer, multi-sig, layer twos, hallways in between, abstraction layer, API, smart contracts, that kind of thing, right? Then where is everyone actually coming into this thing? That's the client layer. That's MetaMask. That's the wallets. And then finally, what are we doing here? That's the app layer. I put Uniswap in there because I kind of like Uniswap. So when you look at it this way, you're like, wow, maybe all of the infrastructure primitives have actually been built, and you'd probably be right. Um, this slide represents essentially two axes. Essentially down here in the blue, 1983, we start effectively at, um, at the DNS side, and then 2015 for the orange, which is Web3. And that's actually uh, like kind of the dawn of programmable money. You can see that we're actually outpacing the internet. Believe it or not, despite what the news tells you, this is actually happening right now. And this chart is courtesy of John Hargrave, or Sir John Hargrave, uh, one of the first people I met way back in 2018 here um, in Boston. So diving into it, um, let's do it. So usability, and we're going to go through this really, really quick because I don't have a ton of time. Um, Cross-chain infrastructure, we're just focusing on one key thing here. Melting away divisions between chains, opening up interoperability. At the infrastructure layer, you have something like Axelar. Then you've got Squid Router, and then you've got, for example, us. And I just want to show you a graphic to see how this works, because it'll kind of bring it all together. Axelar unites 66 different chains, so you can actually send messages, do transactions through. Squid unites all the layers uh, on top of that in terms of, in terms of liquidity. We make it as simple as send payment and send any asset to anyone. And there's a bunch of different companies that we could talk about. Peanut Protocol, uh, Friends at Printer, where you can... Um, where you can send uh, or you can mint meme coins on all these different chains at once. It's endless here, right? But these are essentially the primitives that allow us to kind of get parity with the current internet. Uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about security. So really quickly, again, the infrastructure layer, MPC, multi-sig, et cetera. Then something like safe, uh, like Gnosis Safe or Safe.Global now is like I think it's over 10 million accounts registered there, making it simpler. And then something like splits.org would allow you to be able to do like a treasury wallet with multi-sig and then something like a hot wallet where you don't have to sign the same way. But bringing that security back through. And then finally, accessibility. WebAuthn, for example, um, allows you to, uh, allows the possibility for something like a passkey, which is like the biometrics on your phone. And then from there, you get something like Coinbase Smart Wallet. Uh, which is, you know, 15 seconds getting into to crypto for a lot of people. But fundamentally, what I, fun what I believe is that functional parity is actually not enough. We need massive improvement for mass adoption. So we all talk about this, this mythical billion people on chain. These are the tools to do it. What's the use case? And we go back to our friend, $100 bill guy, right? Um, a penny saved is a penny earned. So just to give you a real practical understanding of what this looks like right now. 40 trillion a year is processed through this ridiculous graph. If it's too small for you to read, that's probably on purpose because there's multiple intermediaries here, and as a result, they charge 3.5%. Visa, MasterCard are actually not even the biggest ones. They're just the biggest ones here. What does that equate to? $1.422 trillion in fees. Now, just to give you a perspective on this, this is like Greece, Ukraine, Portugal, Spain, you name it, all of those combined their total GDP. So remember that map? This is a global problem with global level, level issue, right? And so what's the alternative? Here are the savings. These are public blockchains. They're permissionless. They're pretty freaking cool. And they're all linked together now. Thank you, usability. As you can see, I could transfer a million dollars for under a cent on a bunch of these, and it's only getting better. So how much do we save? 1.416 trillion if we were to use that for every transaction that happens on a credit card. Now, that's not realistic right now. Not bashing credit cards. Really cool that I could hop in here late and swipe my card and get out of that, uh, um, that parking garage pretty quickly. Um, but this is what we've got here. As we've gone over, the pillars of Web 2. Usability, security, accessibility. So what's the promise, right? Why is it fundamentally better? Ownership, freedom, inclusivity. This is a system where it doesn't matter who your mom or dad were, where you went to school, what you did before, what your credit score is, whatever it is. 
you are a part of this. We are all part of this. And we're all probably the weird nerds sitting here on a Friday afternoon learning about it, right? So um, I apologize because I nerd out over this every single day. So I just want to show you for 30 seconds about what we do. Um, and uh, if you're interested, that's great. Um, we believe there needs to be a holistic solution. So we've built on top of the advancements of a variety of different uh, people in the in, in this ecosystem. Um, some of you may have worked on some of these primitives as well. Uh, usability, right, going right back to this. Uh, we, take, we take wallet addresses, we make them into a single cross-chain human readable name. Secure self-custody, we have something we call single, uh, what do you call it, single user multi-sig, basically allows you to control your, uh, all your keys, um, and if you lose a key, it's not the end of the world. Then accessibility, again, right back to that SSO idea. One account, any DAP, also anyone can kind of get in. So what does this actually look like in person? All of these crazy advancements that we've talked about, this is just our take on it. Claim your username in seconds. Come in via Web2, Web3, right here, right? Grab a username. Set up your wallet addresses. Public, public keys, private keys, whatever, it, whatever you want to do, even your domain names that are existing, and then set your priorities. So if I want everything coming into, for example, alice.ox to land in my Coinbase account or land in my, my bank account seamlessly, I can do that right in a wallet manager. Build a profile, get paid directly, right? And so this is essentially a payable profile where anyone with any client, wallet client can come in, pay Alice directly, and you can actually scan that QR code and you'll see one. It also gives you the ability to spend 15 minutes with me. We greatly appreciate it because we build this for the community. We'd love your feedback. What does this equate to? You own your assets, your data, your identity, and your connections. And if there's one thing I can impart on all of you today, it is the following. The new standard is here. Tribalism is, is dying out, right? Some of you might be Solana people. Some of you might be Bitcoin people. Some of you might be ETH people. The list goes on. It does not matter. Traditionally, we look at TVL, right? Total value locked. I think that's a dead metric, right? It's certainly been dead for a lot of VCs who are investing in kind of the infrastructure and protocol layer. Um, and there's not a lot of retail in that, um, that is doing that anymore. This is a picture of a mountain, and I look at liquidity like water. So when water falls from a rain cloud on top of a mountain, it finds the path of least resistance down and forms into rivers. Rivers go into seas. Total value locked? No. Total value linked? Yes. This is where we link it all together so we're not divided like the many states. We don't have all these crazy different bank notes. We're all together here, OK? And what does that equate to? I call it the, de the great decentralized disruption, right? So you look at all of these uh, giants in their own respective industries, Spotify, Tinder, Twitch, GoFundMe, Patreon. These are all relationship-based apps. Fundamentally, it connects me to another person for a donation, say GoFundMe. I can watch a streamer, Twitch. I can connect with someone I want to go on a date with, Tinder. I can listen to music from an artist. What if we could just pay them directly? I don't want to spend $10 on Spotify. I want to give the artist a cent. It's more than they would make right now. I think that's a great future, right? Cool. That is what's coming. So highlights. Uh, and then I think we will have time for questions here. Number one, Web3 is here to stay, and payments are a product market fit right now. We're seeing this right now. Stable coins represent 10% of on-chain liquidity but they are outpacing Visa and MasterCard right now. At Trustware and a lot of my friends outside of even our organization believe that we can achieve great things when we uh, link the other 90%, uh, roughly $2.2 trillion in, in, in assets already on chain, not bringing other people in, already on chain for payments use cases. Hybrid vigor is real. We're not throwing away Web 2. Web 2 plus Web 3 equals a better future. There are some things that don't need to be on chain for everything that touches the user, that includes privacy, that includes like money, that includes your sovereignty. That should be on chain. Ownership and identity are, are human rights. I, I know that this can be controversial, and big data doesn't want you to believe this, but this is fundamentally true in my opinion, just my opinion. Most relationship based apps that we just looked at right here could be eventually smart contracts, right? And so I believe because of that, the disruptors of yesteryear will be disrupted pretty heavily. Um, and so what I would hope is that some of this has, start, has started helping you guys think about what you could actually do uh, because the game is changing. Number one, uh, or the last two things here, 
the fastest adoption right now is in emerging markets, in places where the traditional financial ecosystem passed over them because it wasn't a big enough market or what there wasn't enough infrastructure. This is where we're already seeing adoption, and this is where we can improve billions of people's lives all over the planet. It starts there. So we're very lucky to be sitting here, again, in the birthplace of freedom. I believe this is freedom through technology. And the last thing I will say is, like, I look around this room and I see a variety of different people from different walks of life, from different backgrounds. If you're coming into this after a, after a career in TradFi or technology, we need you. Thank you so much for being here. If you're like me and hopped out of college and realized there was this wacky thing called Bitcoin and like, holy crap, I could wear jeans on a stage when I talk to people, like, we need you too. And then for everyone else that is just getting into it right now, um, it's the same damn thing. We need you. We need everyone here and always believe this because seven years ago, I was just a guy that thought cryptocurrency was kind of cool. You can make something good. So last thing, we're going to end up with $100 bill guy before questions. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. So if you're interested in some of this stuff, uh, you can scan that QR code. It'll take you to some of the information. Um, all I ask is 15 minutes to talk to you because the best thing we can do is that we can learn from the people where it matters most to them. I want to thank everyone for being here, especially on this beautiful Friday in Quincy. Thank you, Cubic, for having us. And uh, now a couple minutes for questions. Thanks. That was awesome. Thank you. Almost as cool as your shirt matching those chairs. I didn't plan that at oh, all. Oh man, that's yeah. just that, that. That's all I was. I was completely thrown off by that for the whole conversation. Anyway, that was fantastic, and I really felt informed. So thank you very, very much. Um, I would love now or later if you could kind of give me that sentence. I'm going to talk to the 99% of the world who really don't want to understand everything you just said, who I could introduce and give them something. It's like the link thing, maybe. Maybe it's that. I don't know. That was pretty cool. But something that I can pass around and have those non-technologists go, wait a second, I think I might give it another three minutes. That's an awesome question. Um, I So fundamentally, the first thing is I think blockchain will mostly be in the background. So people won't know that they're using it, but we're not there yet, right? We have a lot of the infrastructure to do so. Um, fundamentally, the way I describe this to non-technical people um, is, is the following. Um, if your bill was 2.5% cheaper or less um, at the restaurant you went to with your girlfriend last night, would you be interested? Because maybe that restaurant wouldn't charge you as much. And, uh, and so like, that's kind of a very easy way to do it. It's the freedom of money. It's a way that we can uh, lower costs and like say what you want about trickle-down uh, economics. I'm not going to comment on that. All I'm saying is if we save people money, I think it's a better world. So really simple use case. Yeah. Uh, so I just took a look at your Twitter. Awesome. Um, does Trustware support unstoppable domain names? And do you generate stealth payment addresses? Oh my god, uh, you're hitting on some really awesome stuff. So yeah, we believe in cooperation, not competition, especially because we're all weird nerds trying to do some cool shit. Um, so yes, unstoppable domains, we work with something called Space ID um, in the background where we can resolve different domains. So if you type in your unstoppable domain, it'll actually resolve your ID in there um, and, and the underlying wallet. So yeah, good call. Um, also ENS and a couple of other things, and we're working on a couple of other kind of integrations as well. Um, stealth addresses, really important. Um, we spent a summer uh, after we got into Techstars talking to like hundreds of users in Europe, and that was one of the big things. And basically they were saying, I don't use my ENS because it's doxing me. I got SIM swapped in 2019, I know how bad this is. Um, so not yet for stealth things, but at least right now, the way it resolves is that you have to send me a transaction before you can see it. Um, which is much better, right? There's a financial uh, side there. And what we're working towards, although not trying to look like a, a mixer, is that it hits a smart contract first and then, per, and then pays out to, the, um, to the, the, the username and associated wallets. So, even it, so you actually can't see the linkage on chain at all, right? Versus a lot of the people out there are actually linking you directly. And then it's like, well, I don't necessarily want my Twitter and my... Uh, and all of my wallet addresses to be linked for privacy and security. So great question, something we've really thought about and we're working on.